thanks very much for that nice introduction, Michelle. Um, thank you all for coming. And so let me begin with all the different thank yous. Uh, thanks to Jim Simons, who has endowed these lectures and has done so much to help support math education in this country, uh, to the math department for inviting me to be a Simons lecturer. And um, also to the National Science Foundation and the taxpayers of the United States. <laughs> uh, Hard-earned money goes to help support some of the work that we all do. And also finally, uh, thanks to my collaborators, this is a collection of people I've been working with over the past 25 years um, on various problems about coupled oscillators, which will be the topic of today's talk. Uh, the theme in general of these lectures, well, uh, I can't really say any general, there's going to be two lectures with real mathematical content. Uh, the third lecture is about my experience um, with writing for the New York Times about math for the public. So that will be a very soft talk, but about the question of how to communicate, which is something we probably all should, should try harder to do a good job at. Those little people, or whatever you call them. <laughs> <laughs> you to notice in the diagram is um, 
that, well, of course, there's that prominent spike in the middle, but that there's a depression on either side of it. So, um, let's see if there's laser pointer. Does that mean? Oh, it helps if I take the top off. Oh, oh yeah. that I got to shoot that. <laughs> <laughs> right, so there's this um, depression here. What, the way that Wiener thinks about this is he's imagining that actually the brain contains all kinds of different oscillating cells. This, remember, is in the late 1950s. We now know that that's true. But back then, people hadn't really measured the properties of oscillating neurons in the brain. And so he hypothesized that there would be some kind of Gaussian distribution of natural frequencies. And due to some interaction between those oscillators, the ones close enough to 10 are getting pulled in from the wings to make this spike, and by depleting the surrounding area around 10, creating the depression on either side. So, so he sees this power spectrum as evidence of some kind of synchronization happening in the brain. So I want you to keep that image in mind as we go through this talk. Um, also, well, of course, since Wiener, uh, we now know that collective synchronization is a pretty pervasive phenomenon in nature. And it occurs, as uh, Michelle mentioned, crickets chirp in unison, we know about that. There's a very dramatic visual example in Southeast Asia, and actually even in some parts of America where fireflies will gather in trees along riverbanks in places like Thailand and Malaysia and all flash on and off in very good synchrony such that the whole tree is dark and then suddenly lights up as if like a Christmas tree, all the fireflies going on together and then dark and then on together. Um, that's been known for hundreds of years, but biologists have been at a loss to explain really how does it work or also why does it work. There are about 10 different evolutionary theories for why they're doing this, literally. In a, in a review article I once read, there were literally 10 different ideas. But, but in any case, they do this spectacular display. Now, you also have synchronization of the same type happening in your heart, with any luck at this very moment, <laughs> um, where pacemaker cells in the heart, that is not, I'm not talking about an electronic pacemaker that you have if you have a problem with your heart. I mean, you're God, no, you're evolutionarily given <laughs> heart cells have a specialized region called the sinoatrial node of about 10,000 cells, each of which is a spontaneous oscillator. If you kept it in a dish, it would have a voltage rhythm that goes up and down quite regularly on its own. And when those 10,000 are aggregated into the pacemaker, they do a democratic thing where all 10,000 are pulsing in unison and triggering the rest of the heart to beat. So this is happening billions of times during your lifetime. You know, if you live to a ripe old age, it will happen in something like So it's a very good, robust population of oscillators. Now, audiences can clap in unison. I didn't try to make you do that. I noticed you clapped in typical North American individualistic uh, <laughs> style. But if this were Hungary, let's say, or Romania, and the audience wanted to show its approval, they would clap in unison. You could do it, right? Why don't you just try? <laughs> because you didn't know what phase to adopt or even what frequency to adopt when you started clapping. So there was, that was self-organization, what you just heard, if you were listening. <laughs> no, self-organization is not always a good thing. Um, it sort of sounds like it is, but it isn't. And so let me show you a, a video of a case of unwanted synchronization that occurred a few years ago, actually now 11 years ago, on the Millennium Bridge in London. Do, do people know this story? Put your hand up if you've heard this story. Okay, so most of you have heard it, but how many of you have seen footage of opening day? Uh, a few, okay. So here's the, the story. There's this beautiful bridge in London, some of you may have walked across it, uh, that was built to commemorate the millennium. And um, it's a footbridge across the Thames from um, St. Paul's Cathedral on one side, the Tate Modern Museum is on the other side of the river. And there was a big competition to build something, and the England's greatest architect, Lord Norman Foster, proposed a design that was ultimately chosen, which has been described, he described it himself, as a thin blade, like a ribbon of light across the Thames. You can see at night, it's pretty spectacular. Also, you might notice the design of it is minimal. 
That is, normally with a suspension bridge, you have big droopy cables on the top. I don't know if you can make out. These are the, these are the cables that are holding the bridge up there. It's as if you took rubber bands and stretched them taut across the Thames River and eight, did that eight times and then hung a bridge off of these eight you know, guitar strings or rubber bands. That's the design. You might think that this uh, pier is what's holding up the bridge, but not really if you understand suspension bridges. This, the, all that this is doing is holding the cables, but the bridge deck is resting, you know, being held up by the suspension, by the, the tent itself. So you've got this, this very thin blade, uh, and on opening day, June 10th, 2000, everyone came out. Eight, there were 80,000 people showed up. They didn't all fit on the bridge at once, but they all started streaming onto the bridge, and within a few minutes it became clear that something unexpected was happening because the bridge was starting to wobble sideways. Now, you, before you start thinking, this is, I've heard about bridges, you know, soldiers who are marching in step can cause a bridge to resonate and sometimes even collapse. Yes, that's true. That's not this. That's a vertical forcing that makes a bridge oscillate up and down. This is not that mode. We're talking here about the sideways, sideways excitation of a bridge. And it's not at the frequency of walking either. Normal walking is two strides a second. So all bridge engineers know you don't build a bridge, a footbridge with a vertical mode at two hertz. But this, this bridge doesn't have a mode at two hertz. It was oscillating sideways at one hertz. Now if you think about that, one hertz is half of two hertz. And that is, you're putting your, your left foot down half the time. And so you're um, going to be putting sideways forces on the bridge with a frequency of, of one hertz. Now, normally, the engineers don't think about that because, you know, most of your weight is going straight down, not much going sideways. But um, it turned out to be enough to excite this strange oscillation in this bridge. Now, why did the people get in sync to begin with? Well, you'll see in this video I want to show now an interview, actually a fairly ruthless interview, that the BBC did with the engineer, young engineer. Picture yourself being this engineer who has this great task to design this Lord Foster's bridge and build it. And then this thing happens that nobody knows about. It's not in the engineering code. They didn't do anything wrong. Okay, this is an unprecedented phenomenon. So there's the guy from the BBC interviewing him. And it's, um, it's brutal. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, he will explain a little bit what happened. Then you'll see footage of opening day and look for the whole bridge moving sideways and people rocking in unison like penguins <laughs> all walking in step. And then you'll finally you'll see uh, a, a simulated bridge, which is a basically a platform hung on pendulums, which can be made to be excited by just people walking normally on it. So this was a, an attempt by an engineer at Cambridge, Alan McRoby, to explain the essence of the physics of what happened on the Millennium Bridge. And how did the spontaneous synchrony occur? All right, so let's, that, one thing though, when you're listening to it, the, the uh, interviewer, the same interviewer, says something a little deceptive. He says to the engineer who figured out what the problem was. Uh, Alan, this is all your fault, isn't it? It's not his fault. He's the guy who's solving the problem. Okay, he didn't create the problem. Right, and here we go. Now, by the way, the bridge doesn't do this anymore. Um, it's been fixed, so to speak. Though it would have been a nice tourist attraction if they had just <laughs> left it that way, but it could have been dangerous, I guess. Anyway, um, so in the aftermath, I mean, within two days this happened, June 12th it was closed. No one knew really what caused it. And the engineering firm that built it did an experiment with its own employees. So they had employees walking on the bridge in increasing numbers because they had this feeling that maybe something about the number of people was critical. So first they put 50 people and just told them to walk around in a circle. And then when the bridge didn't move, then they said, let's try 60 and so on. So here's the experiment. The um, red line is a measure of how much the bridge is moving. So it's a measure of the lateral acceleration of the bridge. So the experiment was like this. They did nothing for on the order of 200 something seconds. Then they put 50 people on the bridge and said start walking for you know, another 100, 200 seconds. And the bridge is moving a little bit, but not much. 10 more people, bridge is moving a little more, and so on. So they're doing this staircase with more and more people. And you notice that somewhere around 160 people on the north, this is on one section of the bridge, it has three main sections. But on the, on the one section, 
suddenly you start to see this exponential buildup of the motion of the bridge at some critical number of people. And they then told them, all right, stop walking. Don't do anything you know, that's going to cause trouble. But so there's the, that's the second effect I want you to keep in mind. That is, first, we saw a Wiener spectrum as something that might be characteristic of uh, systems that spontaneously synchronize, the frequency pulling creating a spike. And secondly, that when sync breaks out, it does so in a way that's abrupt with respect to some parameter being changed. That is, it doesn't just build up gradually. There's no sync and then suddenly there is. And so those are the things that, for the rest of the talk, I want to describe how mathematicians have tried to idealize these kind of phenomena and look for them in, you know, very simplified models. So, as I mentioned, Wiener was the first to think about this as a math problem, but if you do look at his books, you'll see he didn't really get very far with it. At least I can't make any sense of what he did. It doesn't seem to me he, he accomplished much, but he did pose the question very cleanly. The, the first real progress came um, from the work of this gentleman, that's Art Winfrey, who um, in 1965 wrote a paper, well, actually started working on a paper that he published two years later in 1967, that's his first scientific paper, and it has set the direction for the field since then. Now, um, he was interested in biological rhythms, specifically circadian, you know, 24-hour rhythms. But um, let's not worry about that so much. The point I want to make is that, first of all, he went on to have a very distinguished career. He got a MacArthur, was, was given a MacArthur Award, and later, of all things, won the Norbert Wiener Prize. Uh, in applied math, even though he was a biologist, because he had done so much to stimulate mathematics with his biological theorizing. The thing that I want you to notice, since I see lots of young faces in the audience, is that in 1965, he didn't look like he did in the picture. There, he was a senior in college. So the work that he did was for his senior thesis. Um, he was not a biologist at that point. He was majoring in engineering physics at Cornell. So uh, he, he approached the problem, which other people would have thought was hopeless, but because maybe he was so young, he didn't realize that, that there was no hope of doing anything. <laughs> he actually made a lot of great breakthroughs. This is the advantage of being young. The break. Okay. Let me show you four simplifications he introduced to make the problem tractable. The first one is, you know, if you're thinking about a cell in the brain, how would you really describe a cell? It, it might have hundreds of different chemicals going through biochemical pathways, you can't really keep track of all that, especially most of it is not known at the time. So he, he just said, whatever's going on, there's some high dimensional state space describing one cell, but I do know one thing about it, which is that the cell is an oscillator. So it has some loop in its state space such that the system is attracted to that loop and just keeps moving around on that so-called limit cycle, the red curve here. And so the first simplification is to say, I don't really care about everything transverse to the limit cycle. Let's assume it's strongly attracting in the sense that basically the state is just running around on the cycle the whole time, which is okay if the coupling is weak between oscillators compared to the strength of attraction to the limit cycle. That is, this theory that he introduced works in a certain perturbative limit uh, that can be made precise. So we're now going to just think about a dot running around a circle. That's our model of an oscillator, just a one-dimensional loop of, of circle and uh, parameterized by its angle theta. And let's suppose that we've chosen the coordinates along the circle so that however the system is moving in the real state space relative to this nicely new parameterized circle, you're just moving in uh, equal angles at equal time. That is just moving at a constant speed in this new space. So theta dot is omega for some constant. All right, so that took out a lot of the complexity, but it's, it should be asymptotically valid if the coupling is weakened. The second thing he said, and this is where, uh, this would be different from how a physicist might typically approach the problem, though remember he's getting his degree in physics at that point. The temptation would be to say, let's assume identical oscillators. But, but being interested in biology, he knows that's no good, you can't do that, that will throw out too much. In biology, you always have a distribution of any property across a population, there's always diversity. So he imagines that there's some probability distribution of natural frequencies with some oscillators being inherently slow and some fast. And so there's some, some shape we're going to call it having a density G of omega. And, and an assumption will be that it's relatively narrow. 
in some sense. So we've got this weak coupling. If, if the oscillators were too far, too broadly distributed, then the weak coupling would have no chance of synchronizing them. So you need, like, put it this way, if the coupling is ordered epsilon in some sense, uh, the width of the distribution has to also be the same order of epsilon in order for there to be a balance of these two effects. So we've got nearly identical but weakly coupled oscillators. They do have to interact. If they can't hear each other, or if they are crickets or fireflies can't see each other, or heart cells that aren't passing electrical currents, it's not going to work. So there has to be some communication scheme. And his thought was, well, maybe each oscillator is sending a signal that depends on where it is in its cycle. Like with a firefly, it doesn't send any signal until it flashes. And so there would be a sort of delta functioning thing happening at a certain phase, thing, maybe near zero. In this. Or it could, maybe it's something that's distributing its influence all throughout the cycle. In any case, there's some function P of theta of influence. And in response, when you see a flash, you respond by shifting your natural frequency or adjusting it instantaneously by some amount that depends on where in the cycle that os the receiving oscillator is. So he has these two functions, P and R, that he's going to use to describe stimulus and response, but he assumes they're the same for everybody. So I'm not going to include a distribution in those properties, although you could. So that's the third simplification. And then the fourth is no spatial structure. Let's just assume everyone is responding only to the average of everyone else. That is, like in the room when we did the clapping experiment, you might have been hearing the person right next to you clapping, but I'm guessing what you did to get in sync was you listened to the whole room. And you know, if you were off the beat, uh, you weren't so much worried about the guy or girl next to you, you just worried I'm off the beat with the room. That is, you were listening to the mean field produced by the whole room. Maybe. Anyway, even if that's not true, that's what he's going to assume because it's known in statistical physics that if we're going to deal with a large number of oscillators n, the first place to start is assuming this mean field approximation where everyone only responds to the average. So there's the equation. Theta dot, how fast does the oscillator j move around its circle? Well, it moves at its natural frequency plus responds to this average strength of the pulses coming from everyone else times its response function. Now that model has the disadvantage, well, for, before I say the disadvantage, the advantage is it did something right. That is, Winfrey showed through computer simulations, these are really primordial, okay, this is before PCs on the desk. This is uh, going to the computer center and tape or, I don't know, punch cards, whatever it was in those days, and then having to do a one run overnight and then you come back and see if it worked. And so he um, assumed a population of 100 oscillators that had natural periods distributed from whatever, not 39 units to 41 units. And here's the initial state of the system. That's what I was referring to in any self-organizing system. You have something disordered at first. The phases shown vertically are all scattered. But then as time goes on, through the interactions, they start to, you see a cloud emerging, which gets tighter, and eventually it's very organized. What's happening is the oscillators with the shortest period that is, the fastest ones, are in the lead in phase. And they're all kind of marching you know, through the cycle at the same rate, but with the faster ones in the lead. You'd sort of expect that. That's like if you're walking your dog and your dog is reluctant, uh, your dog, you'll be dragging your dog behind you. That is, the faster oscillator will lead the slower oscillator, typically. So that's what he's seen. Now, the disadvantage, though, is that the model is hard to analyze. He, he assumed some clunky functions for P and R. I think he might have used triangle waves or something. So, and even, even if he had used sine waves, it would be kind of hard to analyze it. The model doesn't have good symmetry properties. It makes it tricky. It, even to this day, it's not fully understood what it will do. So the next big breakthrough came a few years later through um, the work of the Japanese physicist, Yoshiki Kuramoto, who introduced the model that I want to talk about for the rest of my time. Um, it's a model I've personally been obsessed with since I first heard about it about 25 years ago. And, um, you know, every field has models like this. So in magnetism, we study the Ising model, but just keep hammering on it, and it's got bottomless mysteries. So true for the Kuramoto model for oscillators. Here it is. The, it looks, the first parts look like Winfrey. Uh, an oscillator, just a phase running around a circle at constant frequency omega i. Those are chosen at random, again, according to something that looks roughly Gaussian or some symmetric unimodal distribution. 
But then this is the, the innovation that makes things very tractable. The mean field term now is just the sine function of the phase difference. So you can think about that intuitively by imagining, like if you were running around a track, a circular track, and you're jogging with your friend who's faster than you are, but you want to uh, try to run together because you like each other and you like to talk while you're running, but it's hard to keep up, the friend is so fast. So the way that would work is your friend is a little bit ahead of you. Theta j minus theta i is slightly positive. So then the sign of that slightly positive number is also positive, times this number k, which is positive. The, the effect is the person who's behind is being encouraged to speed up, and the person who is in front is being encouraged to slow down. And that obviously has a synchronizing effect on the two of them. It may not succeed, though, because your friend may just be too much faster than you are, and so you can't overcome the difference. That is, the... Uh, Sinusoidal coupling is in a fight against the distribution, the variance of the distribution of frequencies as to whether you'll get synchronized or not. And so Kuramoto then analyzed this system into the infinite end limit, like he's doing statistical physics, and um, showed that he could solve it in, in a physicist sense. Now, it's not quite the same as in the mathematician sense, which is why there's still a lot of questions about this. But, um, let me show you what he did, because it's so beautiful and clever, but it also raises many interesting questions. Oh, actually, maybe before I show you what he did, I will show you what the model does, so that you really have some intuition about this. Um, let me show you a computer simulation of it. I'm going to show a circular track, like I just said you should imagine. Now you don't have to imagine it, you can just look at it. Uh, Anyway, here's, uh, there's a circular track. And, well, at the moment, I have a bunch of sliders I could choose. At the moment, I've chosen no coupling. This slider right here lets me change the coupling K. At the moment, let's assume nothing, okay? So they're totally uncoupled. Here's what that system would look like. There are many lanes on the track. You can ignore that. I've just shown them so that you can sort of see the differences between the oscillators. But what you should be seeing is various colors. The colors code the natural frequencies, just in the ordinary way that the electromagnetic spectrum does. You know, red is, is slow, that's low frequency. Violet is high frequency. Everything in between is in between. And you're not seeing anything. But that's right, because they're not synchronizing. There's no coupling. They're just running at their natural frequencies. Now, what's this white dot? That is the centroid of the whole system. All right, that's the center of mass, or center of gravity, if you want. But just taking the average, if you want to think of it this way, you've got a bunch of points on the unit circle in the complex plane. Just take their average as a complex number. And you see it's very close to zero. It's not really moving. That's because the whole thing is so random. It's just averaging out. The, the reason for showing the white dot is that that's what a physicist would call an order parameter. It's going to be a measure of how much order there is in the system macroscopic. Like if the white dot has a significant radius, if it were way out here, suppose all the dots were on top of each other, all the colored dots, then, then the white dot would be out on the unit circle. It would have a radius of one. So we're going to use this white dot as uh, its radius to be this thing I'm calling here, the order parameter R, its radius of T. And you see at the moment it's just bobbling along zero because it's basically just throwing down n dots at random on a circle. It's going to be size one over square root of n. Okay, but now, here's the fun part. Let me start putting on some coupling. So if I gradually increase the coupling, let's say, to here, well, will the system start self-organizing? I increased it to, I don't know, what does that say, k of 0.81. It's nothing really happening. That's because, remember, we're going to claim that synchronization occurs abruptly when it does occur. So even though we now have let them communicate, it's not strong enough for any order to develop. Let me try going a little bit farther. How about here? So you've got to keep your eye on it. You, what you might look for is um, that graph, the time series graph in the lower left. If that starts to perk up, like if it's... I don't see much happening yet. Uh, a little surprising. Maybe I need to go a little higher. Or I could keep waiting, but let's just give it a little more encouragement. Wow, that's a 
system is determined. Oh, okay, now it, it looks to me like the white dot is orbiting away from the origin. And you notice that the time series looks like it's growing. And also your eye can probably see that the dots are clustering in color. That is, the system is organizing itself. And it might look better if it were darker in here. I don't know what I can do to... Oh, that's well. It magically got dark. Whoa! <laughs> Thank you very much. So, now, you might, if you're really watching carefully, you'll see a few things happening. First of all, notice that the order parameter appears to be leveling off. That is, this variable I'm showing right here, R, has saturated. That is, the white dot now looks like it's just kind of running around at constant radius. And also at more or less constant speed. And also, it appears that the, uh, there's a kind of phase locking effect occurring where the green oscillators are not changing their position relative to each other, or even to the blue ones. But notice that there are some red ones that are, so that's good, getting lapped. <coughs> Do you see them? That is, the pack is blowing right by them every time. Now that, that will become clearer if we go into a rotating frame, which I can do by just changing, changing this number. That, let me go into a frame where the white dot becomes frozen. All I did was go into the frame with co-rotating with the white dot. Now you see what's happening is that the white dot is frozen, so are the green and blue oscillators, but the red ones are going around the circle one way. They were the inherently slow guys that keep getting lapped. Meanwhile, the violet ones are going around the circle the other way. They are running away from the pack because they're so fast. So what, what we see is that the Kuramoto model can order itself but in a way that is partially synchronized. It's not completely synchronized, right? These guys here are synchronized. They are locked in phase, but these are drifting or desynchronized. They were the oscillators in the tails of the distribution, and they're renegades. They cannot be, they've gone rogue. <laughs> so, um, now, one last thing. If you really, you know, I still have some room on my slider here. If I crank it up to maximum coupling, then it's just like even the rogues get pulled in. And just have a rainbow. The, the rainbow corresponds to Winfrey's picture in the slowest ones behind. Um, so, all right, back on, please. Yeah, thank you. So that's the what the Kuramoto model does. Now, uh, I think that's all I need of it. That's all I need of it. Let me now try to show you his analysis. And, and to be fair to him. When he did his analysis, he wasn't doing any computer simulations. This is all in his head. All right, so he just guessed in the great style of, of physics. He just guessed the answer and showed that it was right. <laughs> That's always a very good method if you're smart enough to pull it off. So I, I had mentioned the order parameter. I'm going to be using it a lot, so let me just write it down. It's, as I said, the centroid in the complex plane of the phases. So I take e to the i theta and average them. R is this radius. Visually, it's like this. If the dots are arrayed like that, then you know, their centroid would have a pretty sizable radius close to 1, whereas if they're all scattered, it'll be close to 0. And so what we saw in the simulations is that if the k was small, then even if I started the system ordered, it'll just poop out to being totally disordered with just statistical fluctuations. But essentially, it's trying to be 0 ordered. <coughs> whereas if the coupling is large enough, then, as we saw it, you saturate at some finite, you know, non-zero level of R. And actually, then, you know, in the idealized case, if we thought about infinite n rather than finite n, and imagined taking the long time limit so that we're out here on the saturated part, it looks like R is just going to a constant. This flat thing that I want to call R infinity. And that seems to be independent of initial conditions. I didn't demonstrate that, but but it would be true. If you try to, no matter how you start the system, it always finds the same R infinity for a given parameters. And finally, that depends on K and the width of the, the distribution G, but I'm not going to change that. And so that's our next question. How exactly does it depend on K? And uh, I thought I'll just show you the calculation because it is so cute. And it's, I don't know, I, I once read an article of William, and the author suggests you should always do something do some proof or some calculation or something. So I don't know if that's good advice, but I'm going to take that advice and do, do an actual calculation. Uh, it's not the style these days. I notice a lot of people give high-level talks where they don't do any proof or calculation.
information, and they're actually very pleasant. <laughs> Whereas this can be painful, so I may be making a mistake, but here I go. I, I always like to see a little bit. Um, so, Kuramoto is going to seek a solution where R is a constant. And we saw that that's plausible. That white dot was, appeared to be orbiting at constant radius. We don't know what the radius is, but assume it's a constant. And then in the rotating frame, theta, the big end, that is the average angle, the angle of the center, that appeared not to be changing either. So by um, choosing coordinates, we could set that to zero. The whole system had a rotational symmetry, so that's allowed. That's, by the way, the big advantage of Kuramoto over Winfrey, that it has this symmetry with respect to shifting all phases by the same constant. Winfrey's didn't have that symmetry, so that's what made it hard. Here we can just choose this average phase to zero. Now, the, the trick is that there's just a, a little trig identity. Um, Kuramoto's model can be rewritten in terms of the order parameter itself by just observing that this sum of signs is the imaginary part of a sum of e to the i thetas. And, one of, and that sum can be then split into something that depends on the order parameter, which is a sum of e to the i thetas. So it boils down to this little expression, which, keeping in mind that big theta is zero in the rotating frame with the origin chosen correctly, you get something amazingly simple. That is, according to this, when r is constant, it's as if each oscillator is just uncoupled from everything and is just obeying its own little one-dimensional, you know, first-order differential equation. Th this will come as no surprise if you've studied physics and, and learned about mean field theory. This is typical. That is, it says that the particle is just interacting with the mean produced by everyone. Um, and so it's as if that's what makes mean field theory good. It makes a, a, a many-body problem into a one-body problem. So for our constant, all we have to do now is solve this set of uncoupled one-dimensional systems for theta. But there's a catch, of course, which is that, oh, actually, before I show the catch, maybe I should just say, uh, remark, that we've already now explained Wiener's spectrum in this model. That is, there's an analog of Wiener's spectrum in that, if I go back and look at this, oh, well, I don't have to have it written right there, if I look at the equation, you'll see that if kr is bigger than omega i in magnitude, this theta dot can be zero for some theta. Otherwise, it's, it's strictly one sign. And so the oscillators where it's one sign, they are the ones that stay desynchronized forever. They cannot lock. But whereas the ones that have uh, omega i less than or equal to kr, they can come to a fixed point, and those are the ones that appear frozen in the rotating frame. So what it means is, back at the level of the natural frequency distribution, the ones in the middle, those were blue and green in our movie, in the simulation. Those guys are destined to be locked, whereas the rogues in the tails cannot be brought into sync. And so what happens is, if I look at the effective frequency that an oscillator is actually expressing, that is, I look at its average theta dot, well, the ones that are locked just make a big spike here in the distribution. They're all at zero frequency in the rotating frame, whereas the tails are affected only a little bit, and meanwhile they, their ranks have gotten depleted by being pulled into this spike. So this can be computed analytically, and it's kind of the super clean version of what, Winfrey, uh, what uh, Wiener said he saw. All right, so the model does have a version of Wiener's spectrum in it, but there is something I want to go through, which is we assumed that the order parameter r was constant, but if you think about that, it's a little bit puzzling. How can that be? The solutions theta depend on the assumed constant value of r, but on the other hand, r is supposed to be the average of e to the i thetas. So there's a self-consistency condition that's required, and if it's not satisfied, then this solution doesn't exist. Right? That has to be checked. So that's the, the final bit of the calculation. And, and the, the thing that's a little puzzling is, given that there are these drifting oscillators, the desynchronized guys buzzing around, the, the, the red and the violet ones, how can the R be independent of time, given that those other guys are still, they're not frozen, they're running? So at this point, it's a deus ex machina that um, Kuramoto just says, well, the buzzing oscillators must arrange themselves in a stationary distribution. Otherwise, the thing will not be time independent as assumed. So I just by declaration, let us suppose that the desynchronized oscillators arrange themselves in a stationary distribution on the circle then everything can be consistent. And 
that actually works. Um, it's, it's right. So here's what it would look like. The final step in the calculation is to the self-consistency equation says this average r is the average of e to the i theta, and there's the two populations, the locked oscillators and the drifting ones. For the locked ones, they've just come to a fixed point, so this is an easy integral to calculate. The drifting ones, well, the, you have to say, what is this invariant measure? What is this stationary distribution on the circle? And here's how to think of it. It's, it's like if you've studied uh, traffic flow or fluid, there's the idea that where the velocity is high, the density is low. Right? Like that, in other words, if you're on the highway, you're on Mem Drive, or you're going out on uh, whatever, some, some very congested highway. Well, where, where the density is high, where the cars are packed together, they're moving slow in the bottle. Where they're moving fast, they tend to be spread out. So density is inverse to velocity when you have flow in one dimension that conserves cars or conserves oscillators. So that's what Kuramoto assumes here, that the density on the circle is inverse to the velocity, which is this expression here in absolute value. I should really say speed. And then he's averaging cosine with respect to that invariant distribution. Um, so I can't resist since Aller is here. Uh, that's a, one of your favorite functions, the, the one over a constant. You, I saw in your office you have uh, Sorry to pick on you, but I... You're supposed to say secret. You, you heard that, it's a secret function, but you use it every year in 1803, right? It's, it's this function 3 divided by 5 minus 4 cosine theta, which has a beautiful Fourier series. Because, so that function is, a, is kind of appearing here. It's a constant over a constant minus a constant sine theta. It's your beautiful function. So I thought you would appreciate seeing it <laughs> Anyway, so there it is. Um, and so we're averaging with respect to that. Now, a fantastic thing happens, which is that this integral, which might look a little formidable, turns out to be zero. <laughs> because of um, an asym a symmetry that we assumed in G. We assumed G was symmetric about its mean. And that gets used here. You can tell <coughs> that, but actually then it turns out to be zero. Whereas this simplified by saying that omega is kr sine theta when we're at a fixed point. So I'm just changing variables from omega integral to theta integral. This differential brings a kr outside. Here's some expression that we won't worry about too much. Here's the thing to notice. It says r equals r times some integral can be uh, seven roots. One is r equals zero. That's a possible solution. The system could stay desynchronized. I'm not saying that's stable, just that it's a self-consistent solution. That's like... Um, you know, the audience that keeps clapping raucously and coherently. There's no collective signal for anyone to latch onto, so it might just stay like that forever. Or, if we cancel that solution out, then we have 1 equals k times something that depends on kr, and that can be inverted to find r infinity of k. That is, um, we can predict what the coherence r infinity will be for any given couple. And the answer comes out to look like this, which Kuramoto was able to do in closed form if he assumed a simple enough g. That is, below a certain critical coupling, kc, there's no coherence at all, no order. Then, at a critical coupling, the coherence rises in a second order phase transition that is continuous at this point, but with a discontinuous derivative. It actually grows kind of like a square root function. It's scales like that, and then it approaches 1 as we get to high coupling. So that was the, the end of Kuramoto's analysis. That is, um, oh, while well, we're there, by the way, so that abrupt onset of, of sync with respect to this parameter k, that's supposed to remind you of that thing I showed you on the Millennium Bridge. Remember I said there are two effects to keep in mind, Wiener's spectrum, which is in the Kuramoto model we've now seen, and the sudden appearance of order. Uh, not quite the same, because this was with respect to the number of people on the bridge, whereas this is with respect to the coupling between the oscillators. But um, they're both, I mean, they're sort of qualitatively related to each other, and actually this, you can make a model, I, I have done with collaborators, of the, what happened on the Millennium Bridge that has a lot of the same um, science as the Kuramoto model. So this is a possible explanation of what happened on the Millennium Bridge, although I don't know if I'd bet my life on that. But, but anyway, so I leave that as a question mark. Is it really related?
But, but here are the questions that, that I want to leave you with. Um, Kuramoto himself solved the problem of figuring out this number, Kc. That's a done problem. That was in the first analysis. And so was this curve, r infinity of k. He computed that. But, but you see, there were many things left open by his analysis. That is, I, I said it's a physicist-style analysis. He just guesses the answer. It seems to work. But how do we know that this solution is stable? Um, you know, when you have a picture like this, this looks like a bifurcation diagram to someone who does nonlinear dynamics. You'd sort of think that this branch should be stable down here, and then this bifurcating supercritical branch should be stable up there. But Kuramoto admitted he didn't know how to do the stability calculation, and it didn't seem to be a standard problem. So, so it was an unsolved problem for some years. Um, and that was the first thing that I had worked on with my friend Randy Marolo. We did figure out the linear stability of this state, except it turned out it wasn't linearly stable. So that was surprising. Everyone would have thought it would be, but it's not. It turned out to be neutral. It was neutrally stable, and yet, in simulations, it, the system would seem to go to that state. So this, this took a, a lot of head scratching, but eventually we realized that it um, was related to something that people in plasma physics knew about called Landau damping. And, uh, Galler nodding, because it also happens in astronomy, and you remember that something I was working on back in those days, and I'm learning from you and using your code. <laughs> so, thank you for that. But, um, so so there, this turns out to be stable in a certain subtle sense related to Landau damping. Now, the, this other branch is much harder to figure out its stability. That took us another 16 years to figure out, because we weren't perturbing any longer around a simple state of just uniform incoherence. Now we had to perturb around something that was, uh, had delta functions in it. That is, it was perturbation theory around something which the locked state, remember, corresponds to everyone being at the same phase or, or large numbers of oscillators at the same phase. So it was a weird perturbation theory where we were perturbing delta functions and eventually got it to work. And that also turned out not to be linearly stable. It, it had the same kind of weird land out damping version of stability. Then, just a few years ago, the question of global stability, not just what happens in the neighborhood of these states, but throughout the whole phase space, was solved in what seemed to be a miraculous way by Ed Ott and Tom Antonsen at Maryland, um, using a, an ansatz, an amazing guess at what was happening, not just in the final state, but even in the transient state, which let them um, show that in fact everything Kuramoto claimed was true, that this really this behavior was independent of initial conditions. And the last thing is to leave you with an open question, since in the spirit of Winfrey, uh, I say that young people sometimes don't know how hard certain problems are and just go ahead and solve them. So here's a good one for you to solve, which is everything I've said has been in a formally infinite n limit. And um, the real system that's being studied always has finite n. So the first question is, what is the correct theorem for finite n? It's something like this, that, that for, for sufficiently large n, for most realizations of the natural frequencies, and for a large set of initial conditions, the system will, after a long enough time, stay close enough <laughs> to the predicted result. OK, so it has like five fudge five waffles in there that have to be made precise. But that's the correct theorem, I think. But I don't know. Obviously, that's not a theorem, and I don't have any idea how you would prove that or even really state it precisely. I almost know how to state it. But, but so that would be nice if someone could prove that, and I really think it's true. Um, so uh, I, I think, you know, I could say more, but I think maybe this is a good place to stop. So thanks for your attention.
Okay, I, do we have time for one or two questions? Yeah, exactly. Okay, yes, please. please. But if the R is equal to zero, it's also a remarkable state. Especially in the show, we should see the R is wobbling around this heterogeneous wall. That seems to suggest that under some condition, R will actually collapse itself exactly to the origin. Does that really happen? So, so if I understand the question, you're saying that R really, the order parameter looked in the simulations and you would sort of imagine it should be executing a random walk around zero, but that you say sometimes it's actually well, I'm asking really at zero? It actually go to zero, for real. Sometimes it gets very close and I suppose, well, I don't know what to say. Um, I, I kind of doubt it. I, I think it, it gets closer and farther away. It has. Like we could plot the histogram of where the R is. I think it will be uh, distributed in a way that looks approximately Gaussian. I mean, it's most likely to be near, well, <coughs> the, for the radius to exactly hit zero is going to be tricky. I, I'm not sure what, I, I sort of think zero is not likely to be hit perfectly. I, but anyway, clearly, as you say, it's, it's all hovering around near zero and sometimes it gets closer. I'm not, I'm not sure I'm really. I, I, I think it's hard to imagine a, a path moving around in the complex plane that exactly goes through a given point. I was wondering more if it would damp itself out, actually. No, it doesn't. Yeah, no, it doesn't damp itself out. It, it, um, it, just, it just acts as if it's uncoupled. It's just like throwing random dots on the plane and taking their average. Yes? So, with enough time, even if you have a low KC, would it still end up? Sort of, they, with enough time, would they end up going together? No, it doesn't. I, I, um, it really doesn't synchronize until the k is is enough. But so if it's red, then they'll. Oh yeah. So what? That's a good question. Yeah, you might think maybe by luck they'll get in sync and then they'll stay there. They won't. If even if you started them in sync, they would fall apart. I could do it if you want me to show you, but you're. But you can you can you can prearrange them to be as synchronized as you want, and they just can't hold it because the fast ones are too fast, and are, there aren't a, the coupling to the others isn't strong enough to hold them back, and same for the slow. So yeah, it, it really isn't a matter of getting lucky. That's what I mean when I say for all initial conditions, or almost all initial conditions, the result is the same. Um, yeah. Yes. What happens if you drop? Yes, that's a very good and important question. So this mean field assumption is extremely strict to assume everyone's interacting only with the average of everyone else. And so people have, in the intervening years since Kuroboto's work, assumed things like a one-dimensional chain with only connecting to nearest neighbors or to a few neighbors on either side, um, two-dimensional grids, three-dimensional, you could put them on a random graph. So this has all been explored a lot. and. Um, you know, the rough rule of thumb is that the higher the dimension of the lattice, the more easier it is to get synchronized. So there isn't really any good synchronization in one dimension, even with strong coupling. Um, in two dimensions, it's quite mysterious. There are a lot of open problems. What happens in two-dimensional uh, square lattice? Like, does that thing have a phase transition or not would be the question. In three dimensions, it looks a lot like the mean field theory. So in the language of um, critical phenomena, two seems to be the lower critical dimension. But I don't think that's known for a fact. Yes? Similarly, if you have variability in coupling itself, does that change the dynamics? Hmm. When, when you say variability in the coupling, you mean the mean field model, but with time-dependent coupling or noisy coupling or what? <coughs> that, but also individual Oh, differing had, from had a variability in some were more couples, some were less. Couples. Yeah, there, that that's another interesting question to look at. Is suppose the k varies a little, <laughs> like it's a property of each oscillator, and it could be slightly variable. Um, I think that it depends a little exactly how you instantiate it. But some versions of doing that don't make much qualitative difference. Others do make a big difference. So it, that is a bit detail specific. Another question if you're a biologist to ask is what if you had some negative Ks along with positive Ks? <laughs> that would be like um, some oscillators want to be in phase with each other, but others who are contrarians want to be diametrically opposed to whatever the mean field is. Like, whatever the society believes, I think it's wrong. And then, so if you have enough of those, that's usually a pretty good rule of thumb. Like with the stock market, that works pretty well. Um, so, so I've recently, uh, with a collaborator, been looking at what if you have a mix of contrarians and conformists. And in, in biology, that's 
sort of like having excitable synapses and inhibitory synapses, where the inhibitory ones favor a mode like this, whereas excitable you know, favors that. So it's, we don't know too much about it yet. We're just still working on it. Yes? You get interesting behavior just below the, the critical yes. Yes. domains that modify. Yeah, that's, that's another interesting question, too, is what happens close to the phase transition, where people with statistical physics background would expect any fluctuations to be very greatly amplified there, or in, in a spatial setting, as you said, you might start to form <coughs> domains of organized oscillators separated from other domains of guys of different phase. So I think all of that kind of thing does happen, except that they're now probably domains of frequency more than phase. Yes. The SA node model that you talked about, mm -hmm. instead of them being excitatory, bringing their neighbor closer to the threshold and pushing them away from the threshold, yes. would that make them equally distributed around the phase? Um, I think that generally works like that. Yeah, I think if, well, I, I, no. The question was if you had a model where you're sort of imagining cells building up towards a firing threshold, and then when they get there and they fire, they push all the others down a little bit. Is that what you were saying? Yeah. yeah. Um, does that tend to make them spread out at all phases on the circle? And intuitively, I would think it would, except that I believe I remember hearing someone say that they've studied it and it didn't. So I don't know if I know the answer to that. I haven't kept up with that as much as I should have. Um, I think it might, there might be some surprises there, even though what, what you were thinking as the, as the right guess is what I would have thought too. Okay, so, yes. So if this is um, if the inputs have one sparse graph so that each node can only see a like other number of nodes, such as haters, neighbors, or and fireflies, if there's like visual occlusions so that kind of see each other as a thing. Mm -hmm. um, does the whole system eventually converge to the same state by propagating influence along through the sparse network? Hmm. Um, Converge to the same state as it would in the mean field. Like yeah, well, in other words, comparing the case where every, like, every node can see a really negative graph, yes. completely connected, but yes. was there not completely disconnected, but not completely connected? Right. Oh. In other words, each node is connected by a, a path through the yes. yes. But not necessarily directly to every single node. And so the question is do, no, do graphs like that always end up coming to its. Yeah, they don't, no. Because that's, that's what I was saying, that even in one dimension, or is that not oh, sparse yes. enough for you? <laughs> you know, the non-dimensional nearest neighbor one it does, really does not get itself organized even though everyone has indirect influence to everyone else. Yeah. Okay, thanks okay, again. Yes. So maybe you see some of these.